Not enough. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming tonight to the roundtable discussion. I want to especially thank the counselors at large and Steve Winslow um, for accepting the invitation to be here tonight. Um, we really wanted to start a conversation between the citizens and the government and make sure that everybody's on the same page because we're all here for the same reason because this is a city that we love and we want to see grow and do good things. Um, so I will briefly let you know how this is going to work uh, since it is a little unorthodox. Um, we have three questions that we have come up with based on three topics that we feel there is a need for in the city to talk more about. Each group is going to ask the question. The counselors at large will have about three minutes to answer and respond to the question. And then it'll be open for debate and further discussion. Each topic has 30 minutes total to make sure that we allow for uh, the right amount of time for everybody. And Prisco will be keeping time so we can kind of keep everything uh, moving right along. So that being said, I want to welcome everybody and thank you again for being here and let's open up the discussion. Can we make sure everybody's phone is off? Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Dee Campbell Tompkins. I live in Ward 2. Uh, I would like to start off with a question. And this question presumes the desire and perceived need for more transparency and collaboration uh, among uh, the council and citizens. So the first question is, what are some realistic possibilities to increase the exchange of information between the council and citizens. Thank you. What is there an order? Is there is there an order? There is not an order. Please go this way. That's fine. Okay. Is this this is on. You can switch it up next. No, that's fine. Yes. Fine. Okay, well thank you Dee uh, for the question and thank you to everybody here representing your wards and the city and all that are in attendance so I'm lucky to be the first to thank everybody so that's a good position to be in. Um, so your question is wonderful and uh, I am all about transparency. Um, we ju Just to kind of state what we do have in place and then we can go toward what we might be able to get in place is uh, for many of you all our meetings are open to the public most of them are filmed our ordinance and our subcommittee meetings our finance meetings everything is is open and um, and I think that's a good thing uh, I have personally um, put a um, sponsor to paper in uh, June uh, for public comment I have my um, so uh, it had gained a lot of discussion on the floor and it ended up in the ordinance committee and I truly look forward to uh, talking about that in preparation of that paper. I had called seven uh, communities uh, that offer it or don't offer it so I had gauged uh, if there's a possibility and you know put guidelines to this uh, option. So uh, I'm super excited to move that forward. Uh, personally, myself, as a, an older person, I have, uh, I'm very active on Facebook, so if you guys follow me on Facebook, and um, I carry both of my phones with me all the time to the point where it's, it's I, I think I'm one of the teenagers that have my head down all the time. So reach out to me for anything, so I am all about that. As far as quarterly forums, I think that was one of the things, Dee. I know that many ward counselors host that, 
As a matter of fact, Ward 8 Counselor is hosting that September 13th. It's a coffee hour, so I think that's that's a good thing for the ward counselors, and of course we certainly can do that, but uh, for me, I'm, I'm pretty transparent. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. It's great, great to see people activated, and thanks for all the other counselors for being here as well. So, it's David D'Archangelo, Counselor at Large. This is something near and dear to my heart. Matter of fact, I ran for Secretary of State in 2014. The main plank of my campaign was transparency in government. So I lived it for a whole year uh, campaigning all across this state. And as a result, I, I've sponsored a number of papers. We sponsored papers to make the executive committee, committee meeting minutes uh, public, which we're in process of doing. Uh, a number of other papers I agree with uh, Councilor Di Maria on and Councilor Spatafora. He's filed several as well. So I think, I think we all agree in the concept of transparency. I'd be surprised if we don't, to tell you the truth. I think the challenge becomes is when you get government on the federal level, on the state level, and then on the local level, there's a lot of layers. And the city of Malden is a $180 million corporation, depending upon how you look at it, with some close to 2,000 employees. And with that, there's certain things that you need to keep uh, very closely held. So personnel negotiations, contract negotiations for pieces, of, uh, for pieces of land or contract negotiations for a certain unit or bargaining unit or something like that. So uh, while we endeavor to have as much public as possible, I think we all, most rational people can agree that certain things just, just can't be or shouldn't be. And so, the challenge becomes, how do you balance the things that we could all agree should stay private, like public safety matters, and the things that we want public, like bills and uh, you know stuff that the city is doing on a, on a more public basis that the, can, that the public can see. So uh, I think we can get to that. We've done a good job of it. As a counselor indicated, all of our meetings are public, certainly personally as a counselor. I'm available anytime. Anybody can call me 781, where's the camera, Brian? 781-789-4580. That's my personal cell phone. Anybody can call me at any point in time. Oftentimes, as the other counselors will tell you, we're on the phone weekends, nights. I mean, a uh, counselor at large is a part-time job, but it doesn't come with part-time hours. It comes with full-time hours. So I think part of the answer is personally as a counselor, uh, I'm available and I believe in trying to give the information that I've got as a counselor and whatever is appropriate to disseminate to all the people and to my constituents as much as possible. So call, ask me a question and I'll try to get you an answer. Because I gotta tell you, I, I certainly don't have all the answers. The city government can get complicated at times and I'd love for somebody to ask me a question that I don't want to answer so I can go find it out. Uh, so. Uh, Prisco, if I go over, I can't, I, I can't see you that well, so just, uh, just let me know if I go over the time. So the one other thing I'd add in conclusion is really that this isn't a, we, we have a great system of government, right? And I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Our, our republic and the democracy that we live in, in the, in the country and in the state and in the city, it's not always perfect. Right, and I, but it, that has the upside and the downside as well. And the upside is bringing people here, like on a night like tonight, to engage in the process. I think that really is the best way to get transparency. And just keep asking questions. There's no wrong questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Council. Uh, well, again, third person in the row. Going to say it, but uh, thank you for coming out. I appreciate uh, not only the people coming out in attendance to hear this, but also the organizers of this. Uh, I know it's not always easy to get the people together to help uh, with the worthy cause, so uh, kudos to you. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, Councilor DeMarie and Councilor Doc Angelo, you know, stated essentially where we are right now. Councilor Doc Angelo said there are certain things we can't say, and that's the current law. There's nothing, there's no changing that. That's federal and state. Uh, but I think the question poses, is, you know, how do we get better at transparency? And um, I, I, I would say that uh, transparency has greatly increased the last say five or six years because of social media. Uh, you have the ability now to get real-time data. Not, I'm not talking Facebook, but I'm talking everything. You have the ability to talk to your, 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 uh, your constituents, your friends, your family in real time. Uh, from a council perspective, I have more people sending me emails now than phone calls and texting me, so it truly is a 24-7 uh, job and obligation. 
Um, but, but I will turn the question a little bit better this way. Uh, it's unfortunate the only time when we see a lot of people come to the council chambers is when it's a controversial item or it's a budget cut. Uh, we pass a budget every year that's approaching $200 million, and I've said this publicly on TV, and nobody shows up. You go to close a library, it's very important, and you have the people who go to the library come up. I think this is the type of transparency we need is when we get together, maybe not without a cause, but together to talk to people. Uh, and this is exactly what we're doing right now. I, I, I'm not going to take credit for this idea, but Councilor Murphy has been, been doing these uh, slush events in her ward. And I've had the, the opportunity with the other councilors to pop by a few of them. And I can say this, it's literally mind-boggling to me that when you go to a neighborhood, and first of all, you give them slush, people come out. But more importantly, there are people there who actually are neighbors and have said, you live right there and I live right here, I don't, I don't know you. I don't, I don't think we know our neighbors anymore. And that could be part of social media. I mean, people hide behind these things. And I think things like this is what we need to do, is get together in a room, talk out ideas, not just for a cause, or for to complain, to find out. So I would be the first person to tell you we should do this on a regular basis, not just the large councils, but all the councilors. And also, this community or the city government is somewhat siloed too. I mean, transparency works both ways. You can ask the fellow councils here, and this is no disrespect, we don't ever talk to the school committee unless there's a problem. Last year we brought them into a room because there were some lawsuits pending. We just wanted to let them know that, hey, there's going to be some settlements of big money. Do you, are you aware of this? And, and you know, three of them showed up because the other ones thought that we were going to try to tell them what to do. It was nothing more than an FYI. And I think we should meet with the school committee, you know, every quarter and just find out. We're not telling them that's jurisdictional, but I think that transparency has to work both inward and outward with the public but also internally with our city governments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. Um, it's, it's very important to have these forums, so um, we do have more education for our community, and that's one key reason why I'm running. Um, first of all, I'll, I, I am very supportive of Councilor De Maria's um, proposal to allow um, comment before city council meetings. Uh, I think that's a, a, a step forward. Um, one of the things I, I pick up what Dee asked, she talked about transparency and collaboration. And I think that's really where I want to come from. Um, I want to see not only that we have a forum for people to say something, I want to create mechanisms where we can get engaged. Um, I give credit to Karen Hayes and, and the groups that put on the community union forums. You know, one of the things we could do as a city is bigger issues for the city, present some of those. That is a very diverse group of people, and that's something important that we are reaching out beyond just asking people to come to meetings. Um, you know, one of the things that motivated me to run for city council was to see um, the Preserve Malden group go out there, get a, 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 the CPA passed in our community, and then come to the, the city council 20 people at a time and not have an avenue to express and influence the ordinance that was setting up that. That's really what got me going and, and running for the council here. Um, I saw a group of 20 people dwindle down to two. I don't see the public as uh, uh, an issue to be dealt with. I see it as something to be embraced and that energy um, was dissipated rather than embraced and that's uh, what I do. I mean, I work in government. I've worked in multiple cities. I work with the with communities to work to make projects happen. So I think I want to see not only transparency, I want to see collaboration. And that's what I will focus on and create mechanisms to not just have avenues for people to talk. Um, I mean, I think it goes just, you know, council, I know it's a struggle. Um, I, I also see in terms of the city as well. Um, uh, I'm on the Open Space and Recreation Committee. Uh, I think other members are frustrated as well that it's being viewed as a process just to check off a box rather than do some serious community discussion. So that's the type of thing we need to, as a city, be committed to um, not only just having transparency, but making sure that we respect people who come out and take into account what they have to say and what we're doing, because that's going to make a bigger difference and that's going to get more people out and involved in the government. And that's why I'm running. And thank you very much.
talked a lot about the, the proposal that she's putting forth for the open comment in the uh, city council meetings, either before or after. And I know uh, candidate Winslow said he supports. I'm just curious, does uh, do you guys support that paper? Yes. Would you support that? Yep. Councilor Jeff which, which paper are you referring to? The public comment. <clears throat> public comment. Oh, so the people coming up before city council? Correct. No, we have a process to address that already. <laughs> Any one of you who would like to speak before the, to, to address the city council, contact me. We will arrange it. We already, we already have a process. I understand and I support the spirit of what the councilor is trying to do. I just think we already have that. So, I mean, to expand it, I don't know. I mean, the papers in committee, we'll, we'll deal with it when, it's in, you know, when it comes out of committee, right? So, and we'll debate that. And if the merits are there, maybe I could be changed. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't... Do, do we have the language right here to debate? No, I mean, if we do, then we can debate it, and maybe maybe I could be persuaded to vote it. But right now, no, I think we have enough of the process available. We sponsor people from time to time. We always have, and we always will. So I'm not against hearing from people at city council. I just think that right now, the city council dockets, how many nights are we there past 11? The majority of nights that we're there past 11. And we have very serious business going on, and that, that, that's not to say that what the public has to offer isn't serious, but what it generally turns into when we, when we have had the open forum before, because we, we have had it at select times, it turns into like an hour long and people start going in tangents and things like that. And again, I want to hear from them. I just don't think that that's the appropriate forum for it. So if somebody has a focused question that they want sponsored, contact me. I will sponsor you. And we will get it out there into the public square at a city council meeting. But to me, if it's an issue that like multiple people want to speak on multiple things, then we, then we will address that through our process, through our committee process, through the papers we have in committee, and, and hear from a whole group and do, a, and do community meetings across the city and things like that. So we'll go and we'll engage. The councilor's done a public safety meeting at BB School last year we went to. Uh, the counselor did one when we were up in Ward 8 for a development issue. Ten seconds. I took part in one over in Ward 6 on public safety. Uh, so so we do do that. We reach out. Thank you. So can I answer that? We have one other question. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, can I have rebuttal? No. Sorry, I didn't mean to take No, no. Is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. You want to go, Debbie? It's up to you. Do you want to take? No, you okay. can. Have the can I have a second? Yeah, I, I would say this. Um, you know, again, I, I, my my first point of transparency is it's unfortunate that most of the time we get together it's because of a, a, a reason that's sometimes not that good. It's a budget cut. It's uh, they want to build 300 apartments in my backyard. Uh, we want to put a parking permit together. I mean, things like that are always controversial. That's when we get together. Um, I, I'm not ultimately opposed to having uh, Council DeMaria's papers. Uh, I support it. Uh, I did do some research uh, when she put it in there. Uh, there are certain limitations I would, you know, to frankly put on there. I'd put a time limit because uh, you can't, you know, add three hours to a council meeting. Second thing is uh, you would have to make sure that the, this, the, the thing that they're going to be discussing or at least talking about is not litigious or it's against a, pri a prior board. The reason why I say that, certain communities are very mm -hmm. apt about uh, what you can say, meaning if the planning board turns you down, you can't get up there and start yelling and screaming and using unprofessional decorum, or you're being sued, or it's a parking-related mission, you got a ticket and you get up there and you want to yell at the council. This is more for, hey, this is an issue, we want to talk about it, you know, there's a time limit. I have no problem with that. I think taking 20 minutes out of our day or adding it to our calendar is not unreasonable. And you do, if you do it, we have, so the, the way the calendar works for most, you know, people may not know, it's two meetings and then two committee meetings. So if you allow it twice, whether it be the working meetings or the, or the, or the time you're on uh, your full council, I don't think it's a problem. Um, and hopefully uh, we can come to some agreement on those restrictions, but I support the transparency. <laughs> Um, thank you, Janelle. So, just two things. Um, as far as the transparency with government, one thing I do want to add, and then I'll go right to your question, is under this administration, um, I believe that our mayor has 
brought this forward being so transparent. Uh, Mayor Christensen's door is always open. Uh, the office is always available. So I think that that has encouraged our community to come forward. He's welcoming. He's a welcoming mayor. So I'm really happy that you, the next step is that the community is kind of pushing toward more. So that's super good for me. I'm very happy about that. Um, the other thing about my sponsored paper is um, I had actually talked with uh, Everett, Newton, Somerville, Cambridge, Revere, Medford, and Quincy and uh, gathered how they do it, whether they do it or whether they don't do it, so that we can chew this up in ordinance committee. And uh, I think it's valid. I think it's uh, something that we should value because uh, many hands make for lighter work and many uh, people have wonderful ideas to bring forward. So again, it's new. It stems from our welcoming mayor in our community and I'm very pleased that Councillor Spadafora is for it so I wrote that down <laughs> and uh, so I think that answered your question now whether it's a public comment during a meeting or public comment in a committee meeting there should be some uh, time allocated for that so I hope you come to the ordinance meeting when we talk about it thank you Yeah, and I, um, you know, have experience. See, the school committee, when uh, you know, I served on the school committee, we did allow that. Did. It didn't seem to be an issue. Um, you know, where I work currently, the city of Gloucester, um, it has the same type of thing. I mean, if you limit time and you limit it to the issues on the agenda or require a petition, I mean, I, I, I do understand where David's coming from. It's, you know, we, we don't want it just to have random issues thrown out there. We They should be noticed to the public. So I think there is a way to write... Uh, you know, uh, uh, write it up so that we can have the council president be able to control it, keep it timed. Uh, and I think it also, like I say, respecting that. And when people come out to be involved in the government, that's something we should welcome. So that's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Hi, Saida Ortiz from Ward 7. Um, just a follow up. So, is there a mechanism in place then for? the issues that, or do you decide what is an issue that we would do a forum, such as the safety uh, concerns crossing streets? Is there, is there a mechanism in place currently? You, you want to take that one? <laughs> you want to go first? Okay. okay, I can do that. I, I mean, you know, the, you know, generally, you know, the, the council president is the person who sets the agenda. So with input from counselors, counselors, can you know make motions put things on the agenda so that's the basic process but then as bigger issues come up it makes sense to have those broader forums and i mean i think those are are great opportunities so um but it is sometimes the judgment of the mayor or the the council to to make that decision but i mean this is an opportunity when people see something on that agenda that night. I mean, Prisco has been doing a wonderful job getting those out on social media. More people aware. I mean, I think also more people coming to the community want to get engaged. That's a place they, they find to um, you know go to city council. So let's let's welcome it. Um, and then if it's a bigger thing, the council president say, let's stop debate. Let's let's have a bigger forum. I think that can be flexible there. So. So I, I agree with you, know, Steve. Um, the decorum, the, you know, the Robert's rules, the current way that, that somebody would speak before the council is by either a council sponsoring you or, or the, the president asking for a vote. And, and then under the new process, it, it could be uh, the person would have a certain amount of time or whatever, and that could do that way. But I think the question was uh, outside would meetings, right? Would you create a forum? Would you yeah. create some kind of mechanism for forums? When yeah. There are issues that people are interested yeah, in. Yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. I, th I think uh, I would. So, so again, I just I hate to repeat myself. You know, unfortunately, the only time we get together is when it's controversial. Uh, you know, we've had in Ward 3, there's been, you know, talks uh, for the last 10 years about the hospital. There has been, and I'm not saying it's bad or good, we, that's the time we get together. We've had meetings on parking. We've had meetings on crime. Uh, the Ward Council, the Council de Maria, they put on these forums. I, I know from my perspective as a council, if anybody in this room wanted to do a forum on an issue, I don't mind walking into anybody's house. I mean, I've walked into the lion's den when I try to change somebody's street to a one way, and there was literally 80 people yelling at me at Halloween because we wanted to change the street to one way. But that's how you get, that's how you get things done. 
I love social media. I, I don't use it. My wife does for me. I'll be honest with you. I'm not a big social media guy in that aspect because I think it's better to sit across from somebody every day and look across my eyes. Listen, I'm Italian. I, you can come to my house anytime and we can debate anything all day long. And we might not always walk out agreeing, but I can tell you this, we're going to walk out as friends. Because at the end of the day, I think everybody's here in this community try to do the right things for the right people, the right reasons. We might not agree if it's 30 feet from the curb or 50 feet from the curb, but we agree we're going to try to make this do better. And if you do it in a manner that's professional and you respect each other, I will, I, those decorums can happen anytime. I personally, uh, if I'm re-elected, I'm lucky enough, I think quarterly I'm probably going to try to run something. And when I mean try, you put some things out, uh, uh, unfortunately, you get two or three people to show up. And, and I'm not saying you don't do it for that reason, but it is good when you have 30, 40, 50 people from different parts of the community because you get 40 or 50 different views. So I am absolutely in support of those types of meetings. Just, just to be clear, so while we may be po political rivals at times, we're not enemies. And speaking personally, but knowing from my colleagues here, no, none of them would ever not talk to a person. Like, so part of this presupposes that like, we're not listening or we're turning calls away or we're not answering calls. I gotta tell you, that, that doesn't, that just does not happen. It definitely has never happened with me. And I strongly doubt that it's ever happened with, with either of my colleagues here and, and probably with Steve as well, went during his service on, on uh, school committee. So that's part of my challenge with this whole thing because now if we do start doing it, now we're concocting systems to try to overcome 250 years of, of the beauty of the Constitution and our process and everything else. Because now we're talking about, well, we got to limit debate and we got to limit the thought and we got to limit... No, no, no. I don't want to do that. I'm the exact opposite. I want everybody to be able to speak their mind freely at any time, anywhere. That's why this raises such a challenge for the dynamic of the manner with which our system of government is composed right now. We are a special charter district, plan B style of government uh, with the mayor council, right? So there's really not a lot of room for that. The councilor d d has done good work, looked at other communities. Some communities do have particular things and let's explore that. I'm open to that. But again, just to be clear, anybody here who wants to take part in the process in any way, call me, call my colleagues. We're going to listen to you. We're not going to dismiss you. And to the councilor's point, each year we debate a $180 billion budget. We have a public meeting for that. Last year, one, did one, per, one person showed up. The year before, I don't think anybody showed up. So there's plenty of opportunities to engage. It's, and not to push it back to you, but anybody who wants to engage can engage. I, don't, I just don't see any... We're not shutting it down, or there's no, you know what I mean? So ask, and you shall receive. So there's still more time? Great. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Oh, there's another question? No. Oh. So, so I have one minute, and the only word that I'm going to leave with everybody is, is a very important word for me. It's called responsive. And it, we are public servants, and we have every, uh, our duty is to respond to the people that put us in this great position, uh, holding a position for the city of Malden. It's a wonderful position and uh, so if there are people, which I, I have to stick up for my, my colleagues, I mean if we're not responsive, then we're failing. So please let me know if me personally is not responsive um, because pretty much I talk all the time and uh, you know I do and so don't you counsel. I know. <laughs> we talk all the time. So seriously, so <laughs> it's our it's our duty and our role as we hold this very important position to the people that put us in here is to answer your questions and your concerns and your worries and your what if this and what if that. So um, please I we have all have business cards and phones and you know, I don't want you to walk away and think that your counselors at large and candidates are, are not listening, because that really makes me feel bad. I really want to be here, as I believe we all do, to listen to you and answer your questions. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the next topic, um, and I'm going to hand it over to Janelle. Spencer. Yes. Sure. Uh, my name is Janelle DeVitz. I'm also in Ward 2. I have the uh, hot topic of the year here, and it's a uh, rather lengthy prompt just to lay out some facts 
uh, as they stand currently, so I hope everybody has it in front of them and I'll try and speak slowly. In November of 2016, Malden residents voted in favor of legalizing adult use recreational retail marijuana by 54%. The Planning Board recently proposed a zoning ordinance to the City Council that would only permit marijuana dispensaries in industrial zones 1 and 2. Further, the ordinance would require that such dispensaries be at least 500 feet away from the property line of any residential property, public or nonprofit school, park, playground, daycare, religious facility, or any other facility children commonly congregate. The ordinance can be further restricted the suggested zone by mandating such dispensary also be at least 500 feet away from a substance abuse facility. In contrast, state law only requires dispensaries be at least 500 feet away from schools. State law also mandates that any city that voted in favor of legalization, like Malden, must in order to ban dispensaries put such a ban on the ballot for its residents to decide. Thus, Malden voters must have the final say in whether our city will ban marijuana dispensaries. In light of the foregoing, many believe that the proposed ordinance violates state law since no parcel of land in Malden could meet such restrictive zoning requirements and successfully qualify for a special permit. Can you please explain why you support or oppose the proposed zoning ordinance currently being contemplated by the Ordinance Committee? If opposed, please tell the audience which zones in Malden you believe should qualify for a special permit and what additional buffer zones, if any, you would propose beyond the state law. We can start at the end, the other end. Um, I, um, I do oppose this restrictive of a um, ordinance. Uh, you know, this is now the law of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the majority of people, not a great majority of people in Malden, supported um, making recreational marijuana legal. So I think we, um, at being on in the council, I would work to see that um, that law is implemented. Uh, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that I would work to create some balance there and it would be clear um, the type of areas we could choose from and not just have a blanket uh, thing that ends up being a total moratorium. Uh, I, I mean, I could see something as bold as actually having it right in downtown, um, as well as, or at that um, industrial or uh, commercial areas um, on our major streets. I mean, that's where I would look at it. I think we could look at both of those. Um, I think that, um, I, let's take a step forward. That's what I want to see. Um, that's what our, our voters asked for, and we should do that. Um, I am also, you know, I know that um, there's uh, people in this community that um, you know are working to overcome addiction, and uh, I want to be respectful of that, and I want to hear that as well. Um, but you know, people have voted, and that's the majority, and I think we should find a way to um, you know be respectful of both sides as much as possible. So that's uh, that's my view. Thank you. Uh, a little background, and I'll talk fast because I have a short amount of time, and this has been my. Uh in my ordinance committee. So first of all, right now, uh, I support. Uh, it's been voted, Steve said it well. It's the law of the land. Uh, the state, just uh, after a long debate, I think uh, right after the, the July 1st date, has put some parameters in there. There's some committee appointments that have to be done before the beginning of January, uh, the, uh, right before January, I believe, uh, that have to be appointed, and then they can come up with the, their additional regulations in terms of um, advertisement, etc. cetera. Uh, right now, it would be considered retail sales. So anywhere where there's a retail sales, you could put this store. The only thing the ordinance came in, and the request came from actually the Board of Health to limit the, the proximity along with tobacco and along with liquor, which neither <coughs> the council controls. Board of Health controls tobacco, and the liquor board by state law controls liquor. Um, so the, the committee is just looking, the ordinance committee, by request of both the planning board, or the planning and uh, the Board of Health is take that use out of general sales and separate it for a special use. I support that. Just like we took out drive throughs just where we took out medical use. Anything we've taken out because general sales is very vague and go everywhere. The next step is, do I believe that the current rule in the Ordinance Committee is limited? Absolutely. It is. We're going to fix that. The second thing is, it's going to expire pretty soon. You only have 90 days and then we have to go back. But I am, I will tell you this. The state says 500 feet from a school, we have to do that by law. I've had three parents tell me they do not want it near a substance abuse problem. 
I am not going to do that. So while there's going to be certain restrictions on it, there will be some involved in, but it's just like every other use. That's Nobody in the council, in my opinion, has said no. But I don't want to see a Dunkin' Donuts in every corner. I don't want to see a nail salon in every corner. And I don't want to see a Walmart in every corner because they don't belong in every corner. It's just where we put them. I've done a lot of research. Some stay standalone. And this is just as retail. This is not manufacturing because that's separate, right? Um, parking requirements, security restrictions, all that's going to be baked out in ordinance. Uh, so the question isn't no. The question will be yes. And we will have an ordinance on the books before the first permit can be passed in uh, July. I did some research up last night, I might be wrong, but there's not one city around here that actually has passed an ordinance right now for, for recreational marijuana. There are several that have looked at it, nobody's passed it because the rules haven't changed. And I don't know if somebody in the room knows better, they might be, but I haven't seen a city that has done that. I've checked all the big cities around here, they haven't passed that ordinance. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I just, this is like any other use, we're just going to have to take a little time to do the ordinance. But do I agree this is too restrictive? I do. Do we think we're going to have them? I do. Do I think we should treat it like any other business? I do. Thank you. Yes, Jill. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the group for the question. So I am not in favor of this ordinance. I'm, I'm against this particular ordinance. I think it's too, uh, the zones are not set up in the right way to me. Now, so to try to add new territory here to, uh, on what the previous two indicated. So. Everybody likes to say Malden is a city of five square miles. It's really actually less than that. When you take out the Fells Woods, when you take out Forestdale Cemetery, when you take out Holy Cross, it's actually about three and a half miles. We're one of the most densely populated communities in the country, right? So with that and 108 miles of roadway, you start finding challenges of where you can site different things. Back in 2012, when the medical marijuana piece was passed, by the way, that passed more significantly, I think that was 62% of the vote of people voted in favor of that. We then, at that time, the council voted a zone on that. I don't know if you, I forget if you were there for that vote, Councilor, but we voted a zone for that, and that zone still exists. And lo and behold, across the Commonwealth, there's only a handful of medical dispensaries that have been able to open up, and that's five years later. So this is all gonna take some time to flesh out. I think on the state level, They've just appointed the first person, Governor Baker just appointed the first person, Senator Flanagan, to the uh, Marijuana Commission. So that's still taking some time. So I think we need to proceed with caution right now. And to the counselor's point, I don't know if we want to rush to be the first on this. I don't know if this is something we want to be the first on. I mean, right now, Malden has done a great job of, of coming out of the, the mid-90s to late-90s of of, you know, we were the all-American city and through the 60s and 70s and then Jordan Marsh and the whole thing changed over. So we've done so much to try to reshape our image to an educational uh, capital north of Boston here. And that's a good thing. And now we're reshaping the downtown to make it a restaurant destination. And, th and that's a good thing. So I think those are the things we want to make, make uh, kind of the priority of what Malden is known for. And we wouldn't want to rush in and necessarily put one of these, and now all of a sudden Malden is going to the forefront because of that, necessarily. So with that said, I want to respect the will of the voters. The majority of the voters passed it. We also have to be cognizant, though, of the feds. I mean, there's still, what, 20, 25 states, like half the states, where it's completely illegal, and they voted against it. So at some points, are the feds going to step in and say, hey, wait a minute, we're ruling that, you know, this is still a, a controlled substance and we're not going to allow it. So we've got to think of those implications as well. Personally, I think the medical piece, the, the constraints and all of the uh, formation of the policies, procedures and controls around the medical marijuana, if we could bring those into the recreational marijuana, I think that would help the whole debate, to tell you the truth. And I think that would really uh, then put safeguards in place where people would feel, you know, the zones and because nobody, I think, wants it near a school. Everybody, all rational people can agree with that, right? And, you know, churches and, and places of worship and, and rehabilitation centers and, and places like that. So, again, out of that 3.5 miles, now you're, you're really kind of getting down. To, and some of those are residential neighborhoods. I don't think anybody would want to plumb in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So I think we need to really look carefully at it. So uh, a cautionary tale is what I would leave you with. Thank you. I'm last with this, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Janelle. 
So I, I uh, respect my counselors and um, candidate Winslow with their answers. Um, we don't want to be the first, but we don't want to be the last. So I, I'll start with that. 54% um, of the voters last year uh, voted for this. So, so how do we say no to this? So now it's our job to figure out what to do with it. Um, like prohibition, it's scary. So I think probably I'm one of the oldest ones in this room. But, and I don't remember prohibition. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, this whole discussion, I mean, when I think about it and when I sat in ordinance committee and the discussions that we had, uh, it, is, it is a serious opportunity. Let me put it at that. Um, it's an opportunity for revenue for the city. It's an opportunity to give out of that 5% that I believe will be gaining. I think the state has voted on 17% and municipalities will get 5% of that. That's a, that's a nice chunk of change. And that can go to drug rehabilitation and to uh, some of our projects that we, you know, have trouble funding. Um, so I uh, think that the discussion we had in ordinance last June uh, was very restrictive. So I uh, brought to the table that night, you know, a far-fetched idea that maybe we look at our liquor stores in Malden. There are 19 liquor stores, 19 stores that sell liquor in Malden, 10 of which are standalone liquor stores. I know that um, I've been told that that might not be possible. I've yet to see uh, the documents on that to see if that is in fact fact. So I'm going to still hold on to the idea that, you know, based on 10 citywide places, uh, I, I think we have a lot more to talk about. And while it's, you know, kind of a hot button item to talk about, we have to talk about it. We have to, um, that's our role to take these tough, you know, decisions that the voters have decided upon and figure out how it's going to fit. We got to fit it into our community um, because the voters have spoken. Uh, so I look forward to taking on this challenge uh, with complete, clear mind of what we're going to do. And again, I don't believe Malden. Uh, should be the first, but I don't believe we should be the last. There's a lot of opportunity, so, um, and we have to be very respectful with this, uh, with, with this subject. So a couple of follow-ups just based on their responses. I appreciate all of them. Obviously, it's a, a topic everybody's still learning more about as the, the state law unfolds and you know, the Cannabis Control Commission gets developed and the regulations get put into place. Um, I think to just harp, you know, back on the question, you know, I think three of you felt the current proposed ordinance was too restrictive in how it's set up currently. You know, David, you talked about, well, of course everybody wants it to be away from schools and of course everybody wants it to be away from churches, but that's the exact same restrictions that is currently proposed that would be a de facto ban of dispensaries and open up the city to liability. So I guess I'm going to ask the question again. If you all disagree with the proposed ordinance, what zones would you propose and how would you add buffer zones to make sure that our very small and densely populated city um, still is able to meet state law and not gain uh, legal liability? Thank you, Janelle. That's a good question. So looking at the map, to me it looks like Route 99 corridor would be uh, one of the biggest candidates. Uh, that, yeah, right, for you, for you, everybody looking on the map, you, you know where it is, where uh, Mix 360 used to be town line is, stretching all the way down to Everett, uh, you know, Route 99. So that, that would seem like a candidate. Another one is down the Commercial Street corridor. Uh, I think we do Canal Street now, Councilor, for the, for the medical. There's a piece over there, um, so that would seem like another candidate. But because of where the schools are placed, because of where these other buffer zones are placed and everything, and then the neighborhoods, yeah, it, you know, it does. It gets very challenging. All of a sudden, you start running out of parcels. So uh, 
you know, we'd have to work with our planner and the planning board and uh, business owners and landowners to try to determine if a spot is going to work, and then put it through the process. I mean, having been on the planning board for seven years, that's a very robust process that takes place. And uh, I know how good of a job they do. And that was very well intentioned, the ordinance that they put together. Uh, I don't think they were intentionally trying to screen it out necessarily. I think, but some of the challenges that we've indicated here is what they were running up against. So uh, again, if you've got input or somebody we can bring professionals in to talk about it, then I'd be interested to hear, hear that as well. So, I'm sorry, because you've mentioned it a few times. Um, when, when medical marijuana was brought to the city of Malden, and it was brought to the planning board and it was zoned, is, we don't have it, not necessarily because groups weren't interested, we don't have it because there's not a lot of options and it was, it was effectively zoned out. So um, asking us to put our, our trust in the same council, you know, to do this again, I mean, that's why it was such a hot topic. That's why so many people showed up. Um, you know, and I, I, know, I know there's details that I don't get on that, and, and, there's, and I know it's bad for us in our house on. I know it. Um, <laughs> but, but the reason it's such a hot topic is, you know, when we left it to the committee, when we left it in your hands, there's no medical marijuana dispensaries. We are not receiving that money. Right. We don't have that income. And now we're putting it to the planning board, who some of us were there. The planning board has no idea how to vote on marijuana. So you're putting it in the hands of people who aren't looking at our best interests. We didn't elect those to the planning board. You appointed them, or the mayor appointed them. So it, for them to be so uneducated about the topic and have the final sort of say, um, I think that's what we're talking about is, is that fair, and can we, work, can we rework that? So if I may, <clears throat> the medical marijuana was passed. There is a zone. Some can say it's restrictive. Um, but uh, but there's not one medical marijuana establishment that's ever been applied to the city of Malden, and there's never been one that's been denied. There's not a medical marijuana within the, the five miles of this community. I don't think it's necessarily because we said no. It's because the landlord said, I want big money for rent because I know what's going to happen. What is that? That's exactly what's going to happen. So the areas that we determined to be zoned for this, it's a gold mine. And the question is where? I don't know where. And neither does any other community in the city right now, in the state. So I don't have all the answers. I know by law we can't be near a school. That's fine. Churches, we probably have to come off. I mean, I, I agree. This is restrictive. Do I, would I like to, the way I look at this, it's any other use. And this is why I'm passionate about it. It's any other use. While some people think it's taboo, I will be completely honest with you. It doesn't affect me. Okay? But I am very much in, 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 in a big component on when we put something somewhere, it has to be the right spot. And the reason why I say Dunkin' Donuts, we have too many of them, we put them in spots we shouldn't have put them in. Not because of the use, because it shouldn't have been there. There, there's a, there was a restaurant proposed across the street in the old bank, and you can ask, I know there's some people from the mayor's office here. It had, it had, the, it had the possibility to hold 700 people. You know how many parking spaces they had? Zero. Do you think that's the right spot? No. Now, where you can look for experts, because there's nobody an expert in this, there's absolutely nobody an expert here, I would say, I'm, I'm saying from the council's perspective, and the planning board, they're not experts. There's nobody in the, in the state right now. So I would look to that. But I can tell you, you can look at the state of Colorado, you can learn from that. A lot of them do standalone buildings, they have a certain amount of parking requirements, they want to make sure that if there's lines forming out front, because they seem to attract a lot of people, which is good, that the lines go inside, because they don't want, they don't want people standing out there asking, panning for money, because they all know there's cash, because you can't use credit cards in these establishments. The federal government says no. So Colorado's got a slew of good regulations. All, this, all the ordinance committee's got to do is find a few, you know, I don't say a few, zones, when I mean zones, and put some requirements, and we'll pass them out. There's no, I mean, from my perspective, this is not going to be that hard. This current ordinance, I agree. It was too restrictive. Do I, do I have some ideas? Do I think commercial street quarter wouldn't be bad? Yeah. Do I think the, the Route 1 quarter wouldn't be bad? I don't think so. Do I think the 99 card wouldn't be bad? I don't think so. Now, those could be pretty big plots. But to sit here and ask, if you're honestly going to ask me, do I know what street and what area? I don't. But I can tell you this. Once we pass them, anybody who's got to know that the building in there that, that meets the criteria, if, if they want to charge 20 grand a month rent, I have no say in that. And that's what's going to happen. That will be determined by the market conditions. I mean, these will be special permit like everything else. But uh, I agree, the, the churches would be a very hard one because there's so many people in religions today that 
Literally, you can have a house that's a church today. Uh, I think it would take. I think it would take change the buffer from the, the resident, which I think is ridiculous. Even I see that. I think you start with the church, and I told you the other one I want to just hold my hat on is is the uh, substance abuse places and, and legitimate ones. Not saying hey, Craig's got his own substance abuse next door. You can't have it there. But the schools, uh, which is the state law and substance abuse, would be my ones. And then we'll find an area that's that's conducive to to the type of business, and we'll pass it. And I look forward to. Uh, the panel's input because I think they've been passionate about it. They deserve their input, and I hopefully we compromise because you know do we agree on everything? No, but we'll get it done. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean I, I think these the approaches are good. I mean, like I say, it is uh, a matter of getting the the maps out and really looking at what factors. But um, I, I think we have to have. Very few factors. Um, you know, just the school limit is a huge limit, just in and of itself. So I think I mean we do have zoning to help sort out where particular things go, and I mean I think that's a legitimate discussion. But I am not supportive of using zoning as a tool for basically a moratorium. And so um, you know I'm, I'm I'm willing to listen to the community and see how that that works. Uh, and but it is true. I mean there is. As someone who works in community development, you know, I'm out there knocking on doors and people are saying, you know, people are just, Sparks is gone. People don't, the seniors don't have a place to buy their underwear anymore, but the city doesn't, we, we, we can zone stuff, something for a retail, but we can't make someone come in and sell underwear. So that's the same type of thing that we deal with. So, um, so it is, we can create some zones that are practical, that make sense for the community, but it then is up to businesses to actually make that commitment. So, um, so but I think we, need to you know, have that in a welcoming enough spot that, that fits with the community. So that's what I'd like to see things. Thank you. So, um, you know, this kind of ties into the first question uh, with being transparent. Like, how great would this be if some of the specialists that seem to be up here, you know, worked with the council to work through this so we come up with a decision? Because I don't think any of us are specialists on this. Like, I don't, I don't mean to say that, but I don't know. So, you know, and, and some, some of you are, and, you know, an ad hoc committee might be something that we could sponsor and so that we can move forward and wrap our arms around this, you know, this situation that we're in because we do want to do what's right for the community. They voted for it. And uh, I, I just think, you know, we have a challenge and, you know, our answers might be sitting right here or the help is sitting right here. So I see that tied into the first question of transparency and public comment. And uh, so, uh, Think about that. You know, might, you might be sorry you asked for it. We'll form a ad hoc committee, and and there you go. You'll be working every night with us. So, <laughs> so seriously, that's that's uh, that would be helpful to me. So, um, thank you. Okay. Um, the the current special use ordinance that is being considered loops in uh, alcohol, tobacco, and nicotine as well as uh, recreational marijuana and my question is do you uh, support or oppose looping all of those in together or should we let alcohol nicotine and tobacco uh, be governed and, and, and um, kind of taken care of outside of this new marijuana specialty uh, ordinance? Quick answers only. Okay. I, I think it should be separate. <laughs> yeah I, I agree. I think it should be separate. Just again Background is the, 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 the Board of Health, which managed tobacco, uh, put the paper in as chairman of the ordinance committee asked me to sponsor it and put it for the docket. So that's how the original paper went in. Uh, and I agree, it should be separated. And if they want to limit tobacco, they, they can do it themselves. And then liquor board, like I said, that state statute, they can liquor the amount of liquor uh, package stores they can have to, but I have no problem separating. In fact, that paper currently we're talking about is probably gonna die because it's not 90 days, we'll start the process over again. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would keep it separate. I mean, let's focus on taking a step forward on uh, you know this this about dispensaries. I mean, ordinances are not you know written in stone. 
Um, a future council could revisit it once we've had the experience. I mean, we have experience as a community with liquor and tobacco and good or bad with that, but uh, you know, this is something new. Let's get a step forward and then, um, like I say, it's not written in stone. It can be as we have that experience. Um, if it's successful, then maybe we go from there. Um, you know, it, I, I think that's the type of thing. Let's take a step forward. That's what I want to see. Okay, so I, I actually disagree with all three. Uh, at this point, I truly believe that we should fold it all together. Um, I don't know enough about it all, but I do believe it's something that we have in place. Our liquor stores and they sell tobacco and uh, it's all the vices and I don't understand why we can't just put it all together. So anyway, that's what I So I think I have three more minutes, right? One quick question, um, and maybe if you all can 30, 45 seconds answer. Uh, the state law would allow Malden to gain about 3% of local tax revenue for the seals that we have um, taken place in Malden. My question to you is name maybe the top priority if you could uh, direct those new revenue sources to uh, in the city here knowing our budget issues. Okay, I'll go first. So the first one that I would um, uh, allocate that money for would be drug rehabilitation. The second one would be to uh, balance our budget, whether it's lead in our pipes that go to our schools, it's very important. And the third, um, uh, the third one, uh, you, you know, it's hard to limit all three. <laughs> Um, probably, uh, probably the education of our, our children. That, that's the need for what the schools need. Yeah, I would, I would treat this as found money, and I would do uh, probably break it up three ways. Go to debt service. We're among the highest debt service communities in the Commonwealth, and certainly the highest level of debt service of any community around here. So try to pay down some of our debt because that's going to save us money long term. Um, Goes to the next question that we're going to discuss, lead pipes. Try to find some money put into that pool to address the lead pipe situation. Uh, and then the third would be road work, because we really need as much money right now on our roads that we can. Uh, the roads is the number one thing I hear from constituents. Roads and vehicles, so all things related to roads. The roads and the vehicles go hand in hand, so to address that situation. Uh, I'm going to give you the most honest answer. I have no idea. And I'll tell you why. Because that 3% goes to the general fund. And if you're going to ask me what the budget's going to look like next year, I can't tell you. Uh, because we got a million dollars from the casino and we use that to save teachers and firemen and school committee members. Excuse me, school, te school teachers, firemen and policemen. You know, the big three. Uh, but if, if you could say, can I take the money and, and not have any worries about where it goes, I would probably say the increase of green space, uh, the debt service, and I would probably say... Um, I would say just streets and sidewalks. I would say the, uh, the upgrade of some of our intersections in terms of handicap accessibility, we are lacking uh, tremendously there and it costs a lot of money. Uh, that would be my three wish list. But the real truth is that money goes in the general fund and depending how the outcomes is, if, we gotta pl if I gotta save a teacher's job or a fireman's job, I'll keep this bill open five days a week, that's where the money's going. I'm not, I mean, that's where it happens. So hopefully I have to choose those three positions, but right now I would say those would be my three wish list. Yeah, I mean, I think, I definitely think in terms of making sure we have resources for um, substance abuse is, is one of the top things. Um, in terms of, I, I do agree, as we're going to open up the topic of lead, we, we do need to put more resources as community there. Um, as, as well as, um, I mean, I think I hear out there, you know, traffic um, is a challenge. We don't have as much uh, traffic enforcement. And a lot of community, lot, despite, you know, with our bad roads, um, we also need um, some support for our police in terms of that um, and uh, making sure that, you know, we have uh, road safety there. That would be my top priorities. That's time for that topic. Okay, so we still have keeping the time. Okay. I'm going to hand it over to Kimberly. Uh, my name is Kimberly Gillette, and I'm in Ward 1. Um, so uh, the next topic is on lead and clean water, and obviously that's been a hot topic as well. So um, in regards to lead in the water, are there any resources currently in place so the public can see what streets have been changed over 
and what streets are next to be? And do you believe that there should be more recourse for absentee landlords to change lead pipes in their homes? So, uh, first off, I, I don't like saying this, but I'll tell people, um, you know, I had a little run in with my first child with lead. So, when people say, oh, we're not doing enough, uh, I have the power up here as a vote to do enough, and I, and I, I will say, um, there's obviously more we can do, right? But the first thing is, I want to start with this. The EPA changed the rules in the city of Maryland, okay? So, Mayor Howard, he's not here. Uh, he probably wasn't doing enough. There's no doubt about it. Council Christensen came in, now Mayor Christensen, and spent an awful lot of money on that. And we thought those streets counted. And they did it, because the EP changed the rules. But whatever the case might be, they did. Another factor is, uh, in order for you to have a, lead, a free street, the, the main, which we're responsible for, has to be lead free, and the disconnect, your house, which everybody in this room owns that disconnect. So the first thing is, they say now it ought to be lead free, those disconnects, have to be changed. I can't force somebody, we don't have a Title One. Title One? Yeah. We don't have a Title One to force somebody to change that pipe. Yeah. Title Five? Title Five? Okay. Yeah, Title Five. There's septic systems where you can force. Title five. So real quick, uh, I believe the, li the list is on the website uh, and you can call the city uh, for updates. In fact, the city sent out an email yesterday. Our goal was 195. I think we're up to 180. 100, what are we at? I'm looking at 95, we're at 95, yeah, I'm sorry, we're at 95 right now, we need 150, we'll, we'll hit the target by the end of the year. So there's constant communication going on with the mayor's office. Second thing is, we can fix this problem real quick tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. We could just repair all the pipes tomorrow. But that would be, your water bills would probably go up 40%. And as much as the people say, do it now, we also have to realize, water's expensive now. People barely can pay for food and water. So I think the, 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 man, the, the mayor has done a tremendous job in this. Can we focus more attention? Absolutely. But the same token is, I think it's gotta be level set at that. We have been doing a lot the last couple of years. Did we fall down on the wayside the previous administration? We did. I was there, we should have done more. A uh, couple of ordinances were passed this year, which I'm pretty proud of. We do a substantial amount of work, which I believe is $40,000, which Council Dean Maria helped sponsor. Uh, that triggers that the homeowner has to replace the, the lead line. Just like if you do so much electrical work, you gotta bring the house up to code. The same thing is, if you only do your kitchen, you don't have to worry about your kitchen being up to code. You do your kitchen and your living room, you might have to do the whole house up to code. So that was our thinking there. The second thing is, if somebody sells a house, it hasn't been popular, but we think that's a good time because somebody might have a chunk of money, you have to replace that lead line, the homeowner, or make it, uh, replace it so it's, it's copper, uh, in the case, uh, so the new owner can have it. Uh, absentee landlords, I think it's, it's, a, it's a shame how the state treats uh, residential uh, uh, taxes versus commercial. Uh, right now, uh, an apartment is taxed like a residential. It's not industrial, it's not commercial. It's too low, those are businesses. So is an absentee landlord. We should force them to fix that. I also think if, you, if you're in section eight, you need a lead free, you need to have uh, lead paint to be free. If, you're, if, you, if you rent it out to somebody, the, I've asked Steve Friend to look at the federal government mandating that those lead free include the water pipes. And the last thing we're looking at through CDB, uh, Community Block Development Grant money, I'm talking fast, so I apologize, is that if you live in a low-income low area that's deemed by the federal government, we can give you 0% loans. Uh, it's tough to get for forgivable loans because, you know, that's not equitable to somebody who put in the money, but if we can help you with that, we should be helping you with that. But make no mistakes about it. I can't force a resident to change a water pipe. If they want to drink lead, they can drink lead. I can't force them. Should I be able to, especially if there's children there? We should. But also, if there's one house in the street that hasn't changed, that street is not considered lead free. So we're in a little bit of a conundrum that way, but I think there's a couple of ordinances we passed that has done uh, some small wonders, but I, there's more to do. Uh, but I think uh, any additional re revenue we get that we can put towards there would be welcomed. Thank you. You need a drink after that, Council. That was. Water. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it was a college debate with that. That was, that was impressive. So uh, I, I try to give a little bit of institutional here. So when I used to work for our former state senator, Richard, to say we're actually working on this issue, uh, even back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So, I mean, think about Malna for a second. This is a city that's hundreds of years old, and only until the past 40 or 50 years have we known how bad lead is. So, so much of the work, I mean, we still have wooden pipes running down Eastern Ave that are in use. 
So, I mean, we've got about 12,000, depending upon how you look at it, we've got about 12,000 different quote-unquote pipes in the city of Malden. About 3,000 of those have been identified as having some type of lead, either, either at a connection or the pipe itself is lead or something like that, right? So one of the things that is the biggest challenge is we cannot make the, the private property owner change it out. And in fact, the DEP, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, has a consent order that says you cannot hook up a, a, a copper line to a lead line. So that's challenging for us because even the ones we know that we could fix, we're, we're not able to fix if the private owner doesn't want to fix that. We can't change that over because what happens is the two dissimilar metals, the lead and the copper meeting, actually makes the situation worse. It actually degrades the water quality. That's a major challenge we're facing. I was pleased to sponsor, and we voted on unanimously, as we voted on Councilor Di Maria's paper unanimously. There was another paper that we voted on unanimously. So our, this council has taken action. Uh, I voted when our city engineer, Jack Russell, first brought this to us back in 2015. We immediately took action. We asked him to put a study together. Guess what? A month later, he announced his retirement, and a month after that, he left. It took the better part of, and I'm looking at Maria Louise our, our, uh, in, from the mayor's office, it took the better part of a year to get a new city engineer in place. Why? Because the particular license that you need to be a registered city engineer is very difficult to get. We've searched high and low, and when now we've got a great city engineer, Yem Lip, who's been a city engineer out in, he was in Attleboro, and in, I think in Chicopee or Holyoke, or one of those western uh, cities. So we've got him on the case now. So uh, one of the things I'm looking at, and I've had discussions with the with the mayor's office and with Yem on this, it, Yem on this is what can we do? Do we need a task force? Because quite frankly, we're taking action now. To the first part of your question, if you look on the city website, we have information on lead in the drinking water. We've got that out there. We've got some great FAQs. There's some great resources on, resources on there that list the streets and the flyer. We're giving away water testing kits. Anybody has any questions, call me. We'll send, we'll send the city engineer out or we'll send the DPW out. Matter of fact, we found one over on Brook Street, a lead line that on our records was showing that it wasn't a lead line, but then they did the t lead testing kit and they indicated it was well above the limit. The DPW went out there, they ended up digging up 85 feet of the street because it was all lead. It was in a whole lead line. So we don't know about it until we go investigate. That's part of the challenge because again, all of the road work that we did up and through the late 70s, early 80s, they didn't know to replace it. They didn't even know to make a note that it was a lead line or not because we didn't just we didn't know as a society and, and science the harms that lead. Now that we know, and again, because it's a city of 100. And, 10 miles of roadway and all of that pipe and everything else, it's challenging. So we are taking action. I do agree on the absentee landlord piece. Um, and the mayor's housing task force, I know, is cracking down on that. So if anybody's got any ideas of how we could be more enforcing or how we could get more action on that, we're all ears. Uh, to me, this is going to be one of our top priorities, changing this over. So I agree. There's papers right now that I've supported that I've helped sponsor as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I think I'm sitting with all plumbers all of a sudden. I got, oh my goodness. So we are a city. Did you ask that question? Who, who asked that question? I'm sorry. Um, Kimberly, we are a city of almost 400 years old. So, I mean, years ago the roads were dirt and horses walked on it. So we have a, a, an old city that we have to address and this is a major concern. Uh, sitting in ordinance this year, uh, we worked very hard to identify how can we uh, entice residents to, um, to, to change. So the uh, DPW did come up with, well, we can test it for free. So I think that's a good start for the residents to know that they can you know, call the DPW or C click fix and just say, is this? And uh, they can come and do that. So that's step one to identify whether it is or it isn't. Um, we have uh, been mandated, as my fellow counselors have said, to do 150 streets 
in a year, every year for I don't know how many years. So right now, per uh, the director of the DPW, Bobby Knox, today told me that they have completed 68 streets. They have contractors that are working right now uh, the, in Zanel construction and Tufts construction uh, that are each um, allocated 45 streets, uh, pipes, excuse me, and uh, that work is deemed to be complete by Thanksgiving. So that's very hopeful, and if you add it all up, that's over the 150 uh, that were mandated, so we're going to be that much ahead for next year. Um, I know that my particular concern are the drinking fountains in the schools, and I know they've been looking at that over the summer and working on replacement and identifying where or if there are lead um, in there. I don't you know, I don't claim to be a plumber, uh, but I'm very pleased with uh, Steve O'Neill and Glenn Kala, who's been hired uh, along uh, in collaboration with the director of DPW. And uh, I believe we have our arms wrapped around it. I wish we could go in super fast mode and get it all done, but we can't. And I do agree with Councillor Spadafora that um, the administration uh, came into a, a beehive. A lot of it wasn't done prior in the prior administration, so aggressively our administration uh, and our, our mayor, you know, really worked to, to try to do it, do it too fast maybe. Um, but is that such a bad thing? We are in a situation, but but we're working on it. And on top of all of that, it's a funding thing too. We can't just say, hey, let's get everybody out there and every road has, you know, construction workers on there and we can't even navigate from one side to the other. We can't do it now. So you imagine if there were trucks. So um, I feel comfortable that the MRA is also putting their um, piece in uh, where they are trying to uh, identify some uh, forgiveness grants, which are going to be 0%. Uh, so Deb Burke in the Malden Redevelopment will be doing that. And I think we've already funded next year's CDBG money, uh, a portion of it, to fund this. So, you know, I wish it was a little bit sooner, but I think, I think it's, uh, you know, it's sad that we have to wait to crisis mode instead of you know, uh, be proactive, but you know, when you have so many balls in the air and there's so much to manage a city of $200 million and 63,000 residents, it's, it's a lot. I'm not looking for an excuse, but I, I do have to say I think we're working on it. So, um, thank you. Um, I do have to say there has been good progress in the city of, of taking a step and, and we were really in um, a horrible, bad situation in terms of a lot of this and I, I do say um, we have made progress but when you look at um, 150 services a year, we have 3,000 we have to do. We're talking about 20 years. so. I, you know, I think the frustration I get in the community is people don't feel, even with this extra effort, do we really feel that there is a light at the end of the tunnel? Um, I do have to say, my, my first job coming out of chemical engineering school was working to take the lead out of gasoline. And um, I learned at that time, um, even working with the Reagan administration and then Governor Jerry Brown, his first term, um, that lead was very toxic and, um, and it is, it's, it's a horrible lifetime thing. So. It's important to get it out of there. Um, I'm, I'm glad we've gotten it out of our air, and now we're working to get it out of the water. Uh, you know, my concern is that over a 20-year period, um, you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, we have challenges. Um, you know, look what happened to Flint, Michigan. Do we want to have the risk of being the Flint, Michigan? My understanding is we have more lead pipes in Malden than any other community. So it's something we better take seriously. I, I think we are generally, but um, you know. It's a, at least a $9 million problem to solve, just getting rid of those pipes. We're talking about $3,000 of service. The other challenge is that when you dig up that street, you're creating a crater in that street, which we have to fix. My concern is that we've 
this is actually ended up taking 35 years from the first consent order. So we're taking 35 years to do that. Our roads that are being put back over those pipes last about 20 years. So I think we need to do a couple things. We need to f push forward, find whatever money we can. I would like to work with our state and federal delegation. If there's a bill going forward on Flint, Michigan to fix their water pipes, let's see if we can get Malden eligible in some way. There's a state fund that works on clean water. Let's work with our senator um, and, uh, and rep to make sure that Malden lead pipes are eligible for those type of things. And then work with our governor to make sure some of that money comes our way. Um, and you know, ultimately, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to take some time. But I, I think we also have to ask that question. Um, have we educated the public as to, are you really satisfied that this is going to be a 20 year solution? I think we should be bolder and talk. I mean, have the forum. I mean, I think the mayor's going to have a forum. We should have some plans. I mean, what type of money do we need to put in to speed this up? And what impact that might have on our water rates or other alternatives? Um, I just don't know. I mean, in 20 years, we could be in a situation like Flint and all of a sudden your water chemistry changes and that inert lead that's, you know, we can manage bit by some testing is suddenly active in our water. So um, it's a risk out there. Um, I, I think we are taking it seriously, but um, speeding up, I think we got to look at some ways. It's, it's, it's a serious problem and um, 20 years seems like a heck of a long time to be working on this when we've already spent 15 years doing it. So, thanks. Well, to add to this, I've had two different con conversations with two different constituents who've said, yeah, I know I have lead in the water and I'm not changing my service. So what do you do there? I think that's the biggest thing, slowing it down, to tell you the truth. You know, and, and trying to tell them that we have a zero interest loan program that you can use, and they're like, yeah, no, I still don't want to spend the three grand. To, to change out my pipe. So that's the frustrating piece. On the city side, we're making efforts. We, we've put money aside, we put extra money aside, we appropriated extra money to, to have a, another city engineer come in. So we have our full-time city engineer, and then we had a special one come in just for the lead. So we, we've got the MRAs uh, program there, so I mean, we're doing, we're doing as much as we can. I'm open to doing more as well. If anybody has any ideas, let's do it. You want to do a task force? Let's work with the administration. If we want to put more efforts behind it, you know, I think we talked about mailing everybody a kit. You know, um, whatever, whatever. Yeah, there's all kinds of ideas. So I think we're taking it seriously. I want to address it just as much as everybody else because I don't want what happened to the counselor's family to happen to anybody else either. So, did you have a follow-up, Pamela? Can I just follow up that? So, uh, a couple things. One is. Uh, this is this is a public safety issue, right? It's a public health, and, and it, it should go to the top of the line. There's no doubt about it. But just take a perspective back. Um, you can take all the revenue one year and throw it through the nine million dollars. We can take all the CBG money and throw it that way. But then you don't give money to the to the to the Challenger League. You don't give money to the Teen Center. You don't give it to the North Shore Black Women's Association. You don't give it to Triangle. And then they say we need this funding. We're going to be in trouble. Or Guess what? The school in the Salem Wood is, is leaking. We need to put $4 million in, this, in the, the thing. You never have enough money to do everything at once. And I can tell you right now, my, my oldest had lead, lead poisoning, okay? And, and if anybody up here thinks that I'm not doing what we can do, we absolutely are. And the second thing is, when you want to raise the water rates, you're going to have a lot of people in this room saying, well, it isn't affordable now. Now it's going to be even more afford unaffordable. So it is a delicate balance. And every year, you don't know what's going to happen every year. You're absolutely right. The budget comes in, and that's like the question with the mayor, want to get that 3%, where does it go? Everybody has their own, you know, everybody has their own personal place where they want. I want more library, librarians. I want more math teachers. I want more policemen. But the biggest point here is, it's either we, either we, we raise the water rates, and we, we put that money to, to work right to the pipes. We take every available dollar next year in grant money, we put it towards the pipes. And we take whatever we can get and put it towards there and try to fix it. It's not going to fix them all, but that's going to have implications further down the road and every other thing. So I don't think it's an easy answer. The second thing is I propose in an ordinance meeting we should charge $10 for changing a pipe. Do you know how many emails I got to say it's absolutely ridiculous you're going to charge me $10 for a permit to get my water pipe changed? Do you know why I put that in there? 
because I spent $2,000 to dig my front lawn up only to find out I had a copper line. Because we don't require you to change the line. We don't require you right now to tell the city when the line has been changed. So imagine you getting lead, a lead reading and I, you dig up your front lawn, and it's happened more than once, and they find out there's a copper pipe there. You know why the lead was up? Because the lead's in the street, or the lead's down the street because the lead goes through the pipes. And what are you gonna tell the resident? Oh, I'm sorry, you dug up your front lawn and now you gotta put it back together because you had, you had that. So it was simple as something like, and the $10, I put towards the water pipes. Just to, and it's just a tracking mechanism. So I completely agree with any counselor up here, but, but I take personal kind of homage to the point where, yeah, we should be spending, we actually should be spending more money, but it's a, it's a water balloon. I take it from this side of it, it's gonna go on the other side. No pun intended. Uh, you know, the, the school, it, Salem would need a new roofs. The high school needed new computers. What do we do? It's all a balance. Thank you. So thank you, Steve. The, um, it, it is 150 streets, and I believe that number has gone down from 300. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the standard was much higher, and we were required to do much more. And the standard's been lowered so much in the past few years. And you know, hearing hearing Steve say that 20 years, I mean, that's that's a long time for a city like Malden to be still fuming about lead pipes. So. Um, are we writing grants? Are we asking clean water action? Because they have them. They're, they're designed for cities like Massachusetts and where we have the highest percentage. Are we currently writing grants? Are we currently getting money? Are we offering money? I mean, if we have grant money come in, can we get um, whole streets to do it? Are there 10 people in a neighborhood and they can do it at the same time for a cheaper price? Are these things being considered? Um, no disrespect, because I know this is a, a, a really hot topic. Um, and it, it boils down to kids and schools and water. So are, are we doing enough with grant writing? Is that something that's happening in the city right now? So can I just ask a, uh, a question? Are you asking about money to replace the main water line? No, for, um, for homeowners. So how can we incentivize homeowners? Okay. Because that seems to be the issue. Yeah. It's not necessarily that the city's not willing to do it, but that small connecting okay. piece. Yep. So how do we incentivize that other than selling a home? Because people aren't selling homes. And if you're renting out a three-story home, you're not selling it in Malden right now. You're banking on it in Malden right, right. now. Yep. So how do we get those people to change over that line? Because they are making money on those homes. So can, I'm going to take a stab at that. But before I do, um, one minute. Oh. Um, we, in this process, have found out that all the lines that are deemed lead are really not. And this is through the um, uh, Bobby Knox, the DPW. Uh, our, our, our challenge is the paperwork over the years hasn't been right on point. So I think a lot of this, why I'm not minimizing you know, this urgency and this health urgency, a lot of our tracking and our, um, you know, our, our record keeping isn't as good as it should be. So I, I just want to kind of tone it down a little bit that you know, we seem to be like, oh my god, we're Flint, Michigan. Let, let's just keep the fact that we're such an old city um, you know, at arm's length. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, that the uh, Malden Redevelopment is looking for uh, forgivable grant uh, monies, which is a 0%, um, which is great. And we are offering up our CDBG money to accelerate the process. Grant writing, I'm not quite sure. Grant writing would be through the Malden Redevelopment, and I'm sure uh, the administration is pushing for that so that we can obtain money so we can move uh, faster. It looks like we are on point. Uh, I don't know, 20 years, did you, uh, Candidate Winslow, did you calculate that it will take 20 years? Is I mean, I read the report um, that just recently came out. It, there's 3,000 services that are uh, out there, and it's 150 a year if we keep at this pace. It's that's right. 20 years. So, so it's, it's again, it's out, recorded so. 3,000. But as we address these um, these challenges, not all of it is fact. So you know, it would be my hope that 3,000 really maybe becomes 
maybe 2,000, which still isn't adequate, but it, uh, I think we need to be hopeful with that, and that's what our DPW is actively doing, so. Thank you, so a minute. So what I would say is two things. Uh, I was the only one to vote against the budget. In my comments of, for voting against the budget, I indicated that I thought more money should be allocated towards the lead. Although we put money in there, I thought it should have been more. So, you know, I have the courage of my convictions that way. I know I'm in the minority, but again, that's how strongly I feel about this issue. So definitely I agree with you, and I want to put the money there. Second thing, yes, we need more money, but then what do we do with the money? I mean, right now, the DPW staffing is at the lowest level it's been historically. If you go back 20 years, you know, it was in the hundred, there was a hundred something people in DPW. Now you're at 25, 26. 26 DPW staffers. So that's a reality of it too. We just have physically less people to be able to do that. That's part of it. And then the other piece of it too is we need some help from, the, you indicated Kim, and it's a good point, from the feds, from the state, particularly like the lawyer types, and whether we have to get a special act of the legislature or not, but we've got to figure out a way to be able to, we have the ways to incent the, the, the homeowners to change over. I think there's enough of that, quite frankly. I think we've got to force them. I think we're going to say, and at some point, Councillor, you, you may remember, but we, we are looking into how, what are the opportunities for us to be able to say, no, you know what, you can't pull that permit for your kitchen until you, you change your service over. Thank you. you know, the lawyer said maybe, maybe not, so oh, I'm out of time, sorry. So yes, yes. Yeah, I, I would say this, to, to the, the point, Kim, about the 100, the 300 to the 150, I, I don't remember, recall the numbers off the top of my head, but I just know this. Uh, the feds changed the formula on us midway through. They said, that doesn't count unless you do the entire street, doesn't count, so those services don't count. So I don't know the particulars there, but the math changed. Now, they probably changed it because we weren't moving fast enough. So, but to be all, they changed the formula. It's very hard for me to sit up and tell you, I don't know how we force people to change their line. I can't come on your property and force you to change your line. So there is a challenge there. And, unless some, we're going to pay for it, yeah, you're gonna let me do it if I'm gonna pay for it. Right. But then also, how about the people who pay for it themselves? You gotta create some equity there, right? Um, I think the Fed should pass something like I think it's Title I where the septic system, and we've done it at a local level, Title V. Uh, we, we put in the ordinance, if you're doing a certain amount of work in your house, you have to do it, it triggers that. Again, Kim said it best. The housing property in Marlin is skyrocketing. 3,500 bucks, 5,000 bucks for, for public safety is not a big nut for me to, I think for someone to swallow. And I don't mean this to be a joke, don't take it rude. We passed it. I was here and I voted against it, but not for the for those reasons. We asked people to pay two dollars for a trash bag. If you make, if I force you to change a water line, it costs you three grand. Some cases five. How do you, how do you think that's going to go over? I mean, all seriousness. Because the easy thing is to do. Let's pass an ordinance tomorrow and say within two years everybody's going to change their lead line. We could do that. Um. You know, I do think there are, uh, you know, I haven't looked at all the legal, re re you know, options here. Uh, you know, I am an attorney, so I could, I could look at that. I mean, we do, in our state constitution, people have the right to a clean environment. Um, we do have laws that protect our children, that um, if you abuse your child in your house, you, uh, you know, that can be, have consequences. So, um, you know, that, that is something. Um, I think there are creative ways. Uh, I, in the city of Gloucester, has tackled this issue um, where I work. I talked to our uh, CDBG person there. They did work out these issues. We can look at other communities. We do have more to tackle. We have a big thing, and that's some of it. I'm putting this stuff out here because I think when we have the forum in the fall, um, we need to have clear um, information for our community about how um, substantial this problem is, um, how hard it is. And, and really, you know, I think, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, we did as a community step forward um, and pass with the uh, efforts of Preserve Mall and the Community Preservation Act. If we draft something that is sensitive to um, our low income folks, there are people who are gonna want to move this forward. I see it as both a public health issue, but this can hold back and bought back Malden for the next 20 years as, as an economic issue um, as well. So um, we may be penny wise and pinching our pennies now, but our community may not grow because people don't wanna come to a community and risk having their kids exposed to lead because it's a crapshoot. 
So we have to get this under control, and um, I think that's what we need, is that we need um, to understand this information, get it out there to the public, ask the public tough questions, and say, there, there is always this challenge in the environmental field of how, what is your risk tolerance and how fast you want to go. We can find that out, and if we educate and have a good, good forums and put that out there, and I'm willing to have discussion and have money be part of that discussion understanding that there are people in this community that might be difficult. But there are assessments, there are forgivable loans, there are options that if we as a community come up with more money, we can make this more quick and we can work with our state and federal delegations to address this because it is a bigger problem for us. So let's ask for help. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, I just want to take a second to thank everybody for coming tonight and thank everybody on the panel and the counselors for being here. I hope this leads to more open conversations and more conversations like this that everybody was able to to talk openly and get some answers and hopefully that helps the rest of the community get some answers and thank you to MATV for being here. To so we can bring it to those who weren't able, able to be here. And now you can all go home. Thank you so much.